and I'll get us started with about why we're talking about native plants and what they have to do with the watershed. So we are a small watershed, it's 25 square miles, and it um, touches on North Oaks, White Bear Lake, Lino Lakes, Badness Heights, and Gem Lake. Um, there are watersheds all over the metro. Um, so folks from Plymouth or uh, the other side, the west side of the metro, uh, there is a watershed that functions a lot like us. And if you're outside the metro in Wisconsin or Osceola, um, there is, um, at, that, at that point, there's a soil and water conservation district. So their programming might be similar to what we have, but um, they'll have similar, a similar focus. Um, okay, so in order to uh, talk about uh, native plants, we, we've got to really start with soil, uh, and soil is the connection to water. Um, this is what our landscape looked like pre-settlement. Um, of course, you know, that's, it's pretty and pristine, but, but the, the important piece here is um, there's a function to undeveloped soil. And the function of undeveloped soil connected to the water cycle. Um, development isn't bad in itself, and of course we're all here to enjoy it, but uh, we're now trying to backtrack and create a balance to reestablish this function. So um, we had oak savanna, wet meadow, prairies, um, deep root structures throughout the landscape, and uh, that was that was all connected to air and water moving through soil pores right now to what basically keep every everything moving um, and everything moved slow in that way so now with our development we have lots of compacted soil oh, due to construction. Hear this. i'm gonna i'm gonna click mute just so we've got we've got it everybody okay thank you um yeah all the compacted soil makes water move off the surface and uh, turf grass uh, only absorbs about a third of the rain that would fall on it in a given rain event so when water falls hard and heavy real fast uh, we get a lot falling running off the surface and of course pavement adds to that so water is going into the storm drain network and uh, bypassing soil altogether. So at that point, it's not a watershed, it's more of a pipe shed, is what we like to call it. And when we look at the function, the system of native plant communities, uh, we can see all these different types, how they work together with wet meadow, prairie, uh, forest. Um, when we compare that to what it looks like now, we don't have much native plant community. You know, we have native plants scattered across the landscape as we're trying to plant uh, and garden, but uh, as far as the function of native plant communities, uh, we've, we've lost a whole lot. And with that comes all these issues about water quality. So we've got characters who might just dump things down the storm drain. Uh, we've got all those acres of turf that lead to uh, grass clippings being either just blown into the street or sometimes those nutrients will be washing off the surface and that goes straight to a water body, causes algae blooms and uh, high nutrient levels. And with higher flash, with more water moving faster, we have more volume to cause erosion and more damage to our stream banks. And then that of course clogs the infrastructure. Um, more sediment moving will end up somewhere, and it costs money to be dredging out culverts and all of those places. Um, this is just a quick look at what it is on the tail end. Um, you know, if, if we're looking at the, the front end of the landscape, what's planted in the soil, um, the tail end is the water. And here at Vlamo, we measure the water quality, and um, this. Uh, is a reflection of what's happening around the lake, what's happening on the soil. We have something like Birch Lake and Black Lake that are really clean. These are healthy lakes and they have uh, healthy soil and some areas around them 
that are that are doing really well. Um, the areas around, uh, say, Wilkinson, Gilfinnan, Tamarack, East Goose, the history of these lakes has really amped up the nutrient level. So when the state standard is here at this yellow arrow, uh, these lakes are above the state standard with phosphorus and chlorophyll A. Um, more information about these nutrients and how what they mean to water quality is on our website um, um, under our blog. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to look into that uh, if, if you're interested. And uh, what Tracy's going to talk about touches on planning a project. So if folks are trying to plant this spring, think about uh, what is possible. Um, other watersheds like us will have a GIS web map. And this is a tool to uh, look at topography. Uh, you can measure things and sort of draw out a plan for uh, what you're working with and uh, communicate with a landscaper or, or contractor to um, yeah, communicate a vision. Um, so that's, that's a tool that we can use. And it also has uh, data for uh, working around floodplains. And of course, that's a, it's a big issue as we have wet years and wet soil. Um, we can look at a five year, 10 year, and 100 year storm event and what's projected for uh, the water level. So here in the pink, um, this area would be a 100 year storm event. And um, it helps to know where, know where our floodplain uh, is um, in order to work around it and maybe even um, support it, uh, which Tracy will be talking about. Um, so we have a tutorial how to use that web map uh, on our YouTube page. And then we have our cost share program. Um, Tyler Thompson coordinates this. If you live in the watershed, uh, he will be able to plug you into grant funds to build a project like this. Um, so you wanna say anything about that, Tyler? So I know um, there's a lot of folks from um, around the state, a couple of folks from Wisconsin, but uh, like Nick mentioned earlier, um, if you're within a watershed in the Metro, there's a good chance that they have a cost share program. So if you're looking to do a native planting or rain garden or something like that, um, contact your local watershed to see if they might have grant funds available. Um, if you do live in Blamo, we do have a cost share program to support these projects so you can get grant funding from us. Um, so if you're within Blamo and you're interested, let me know. Otherwise, um, we can also help direct you to your proper watershed or soil and water conservation district too. So. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. And one quick shameless plug is the adopt a drain program. So as I mentioned, the connection between um, streets and landscape into lakes and rivers, uh, the adopt a drain is a voluntary program that folks around the Metro uh, sign up for to clean out a nearby storm drain. And the website allows you to track how much debris as uh, you're removing from a water body. Um, it's just a basic estimate, but it can be fun. It gets, gets folks outside and uh, when everybody's doing a little bit of cleaning, it adds up to a big impact. So, With that, uh, we'll move on to the main event. Um, Tracy has presented uh, in person in previous years, um, Two years now and uh, she always has lots of insight and more more information than we ever have time for because there's it's such a rich topic but um, uh, coming from natural shore technologies uh, we work with Tracy for a number of our projects um, that are large large public um, projects um, for shoreline restorations and and rain gardens so with that Tracy thank you and I'll hand it off Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Nick and Tyler, for having me. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm Tracy from Natural Shore. Uh, Natural Shore is a company out of um, Independence, Minnesota. We're an ecological restoration company. 
we do designs, um, installation, and maintenance of native plantings, including prairies, wetlands, shorelines, rain gardens, um, things like that. And we also have a greenhouse where we grow all of our own native plants. So um, I'll just start talking a little bit about some common home landscaping problems. The theme for tonight is bringing native plants closer to home. And um, here's kind of a few landscaping issues that come along with turf grass or a few other um, native plants. I think I need to switch it actually to... Oh, I stopped my share, so now okay. you can share, Tracy. Okay. Yeah. We'll get to my slide. Let me switch over here. One second. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, that should be working now. Um, yeah, here we go. Some common problems we have with turf grass um, is erosion, some degraded habitats, the maintenance costs associated with turf grass as far as um, mowing it all the time and watering it, um, nuisance wildlife, uh, a lot of uh, people on Shorelines have issues with geese that come into their uh, lawns and defecate quite a bit. Um, this in turn goes back to some of those nutrient loadings that Nick was talking about where those nutrients run into the lake and cause some water quality issues. So um, just a flat landscape of uh, turf grass really allows those geese to easily access some people's properties. Um, here's another picture of some erosion issues and it's a, another issue with sediment that goes into the lake after a large storm event. Um, that sediment causes pollution as well. So it's real, and once something like this starts happening, it's really a matter of time before um, the issue gets worse. And turf grass has very short root system, so that kind of accentuates the problem, causing that sediment to run into the water. Um, it's also pretty um, important to keep the shoreline that you have, it, you can't really build it back up, so um, people that live on these lakes just don't wanna lose any of their property and their shoreline, so that's a good um, reason to plant natives as well. We talked a little bit about nuisance wildlife. Here's just a picture of, um, it kind of is a good example of how those nutrients enter a pond system like this, really create a lot of that um, duckweed and algae issues because those nutrients are being um, pushed into this system and overloading the system quite a bit. In this picture, you can see a lot of turf grass um, and to, they usually water that quite a bit, and that attracts geese even more as, as these the grass grows, and they're just like uh, little cows that come in in herds like that. So, uh, here is some more uh, maintenance costs associated with lawns, fertilizer, and time. Um, you usually have to mow your lawn every couple days, and or especially when we have a season like last year when it rained pretty much all year long every couple of days. So that's, it's um, just a big time sink. So that's something that should be, you know, thought about. There's always maintenance, maintenance uh, with native plantings as well, but it's a little bit less as far as um, mowing your lawn a couple times a week. Another example of some common landscaping mistakes is introducing invasive species. Um, right here we have a large stand of, it's called Chinese silvergrass or miscanthus. And it looks very, very pretty, but um, oftentimes it can spread into native areas. It's uh, very aggressive. Sometimes they have a sterile 
version of it, but um, oftentimes a lot of our invasive species that we have now come from the ornamental trade where they've escaped cultivation and now have infiltrated our native areas. Um, I also wanted to include some pictures of some cattail and some reed canary grass here, um, just kind of reminding us how these landscapes look close to home. Um, it's not really aesthetically very pleasing because it's just a monoculture of one plant. Uh, reed canary grass has very dense root systems that form these multi monocultures of one plant um, and aesthetically it's just not really something that people like to look at just one thing. Um, it also gets a lot taller than turf grass and you can't always see the lake. That's an issue with some of this cattail up here where it grows very very tall and kind of blocks your view to some of your your pretty lakes um, that we have in Minnesota. Um, and yeah, non-native cultivars, I'll get into that a little bit later, um, just kind of some issues that run with those. One of those can be them hybridizing with um, native uh, species and that can cause some issues as well. Um, and as far as turf grass goes, again, just kind of highlighting how much of a desert it can be, it's another monoculture um, that is bare aesthetically. I don't personally think it does much, but it also has the issue of there being a habitat desert where there's nothing blooming on this landscape. There's no habitat for birds to nest in. There's not gonna be any bees that visit this, especially if it's a homeowner that uses broadleaf herbicides to kill dandelions that might be coming up or um, anything that tries to get into this turf grass is usually discouraged with herbicides. So it really doesn't do a whole lot for any kind of insect or other wildlife species. Um, and Nick was talking too about how, sh you know, the velocity of water running off a landscape a lot of that water um, can run into directly into lakes, not just into storm water drains that go into lakes, but um, shorelines, lakes oftentimes kind of sit in a basin where um, the surrounding area is pretty hilly. So in this case, that water hits this property and runs straight into the lake. It also, um, catches up speed, which takes sediment with it, with that erosion. And also it's just very unfun to mow a hillside like this. And you might end up in the lake, which happens. Um, invasive species are a big concern uh, in a lot of areas that we deal with, um, especially areas close to lake shores or in developed areas all over the uh, urban um, try we we mostly do um, our projects within the Twin Cities metro area, and these urban sites are very disturbed sites where these invasive species um, will come in after there's been any kind of development, any kind of soil disturbance, and they are the the primary um, colonizers after that event. Um, they directly outcompete native plants, um, but they also have chemicals. They're called aliopathic chemicals, where, um, like down here in this this picture here, this is a um, infestation of garlic mustard, and that garlic mustard actually puts chemicals into the soil that alters the soil, so other plants can't grow. Um, and native plants can't grow, and it really only favors the, the plant that is taking over and creating that monoculture. Um, these invasive species usually come from different areas of the world. We have a lot of these invasive species from Europe and um, Asia. 
a lot of our native species actually gets trans transferred over there too and they have issues with some of our native species so we've kind of traded species um, and they're having issues and most of that is because you have fewer natural predators that have evolved with these plant species to kind of keep them in check so um, here we don't have a lot of invasive or um, uh, native predators to keep these invasive species in line. Um, here we have kind of an infestation of buckthorn in this woodland area that also has some aliopathic biochemicals. I think a lot of people are familiar with buckthorn. Um, it, and once that infiltrates a community of native plants, it's, it's pretty hard to get it out, especially if in these urban environment, your neighbor might have it in their lot, and then once you remove your um, infestation, birds or other animals might bring the seeds in from um, your neighbor. So it's, it's a pretty tough battle. We fight every day with these invasive species, but it's definitely one worth fighting. I was at a site today who had um, a woodland that looked just like this with buckthorn everywhere. They took it out and now there's um, Jack in the Pulpit coming up and bell warts and wild ramps. So um, that and that these are things that mostly just came up by themselves from the seed bank once these invasive species were removed. So that made me pretty happy. Um, here we'll talk about a little bit of the cultivar issues that I'm seeing quite a bit. Uh, cultivars are things that you might get from uh, big box stores like Home Depot or Lowe's. They might say that they're native or a native are, or uh, they might have the name Echinacea on them, but they, or Black Eyed Susan, they, but they're different than our native plants. Um, they might have a, a scientific name with a um, like a, an added name after it, which means it's a cultivar. And they do offer some benefits other than turf grass because, you know, they're a flower. But in this one here, this is an echinacea where they made it a double petaled echinacea. And it's very pretty, but native pollinators can't penetrate into that flower because the petals are so thick so it might be pretty for us but it really offers not a lot of um, pollinator benefit. Flowers offer pollen and nectar as a reward to pollinators for um, you know so the pollinators will come to get the pollen to bring to you another flower and so the whole point of it is that an insect can get into a flower to get that pollen. And when it's double petaled or, or um, when the leaf structure and, and flower structure are different, that is inhibited. Um, there's also different colors that come along with these cultivars. They're specifically bred to have different colors. Um, a lot of insects can actually see the UV lights on this, the color spectrum, the light spectrum. So these plants, even though we can't see them, they have what's called nectar guides, like little lights, that, or I mean little um, lines that are, um, you can see under UV lights that direct an insect into its flowering, um, the nectar and, and sexual reproductive parts. And these cultivars are bred to have different colors we might not be able to see what this looks like under UV, but a, a bug could, and um, it might look different. So they're evolved to kind of live with these plants and know how to, um, to pollinate them. Some species of insects are actually specialists, with, which mean they have to um, visit very certain species of native plants. And if they go to this native plant thinking it's a black-eyed Susan, but it actually is a different color, then they might not be able to pollinate it or they might pass it over. 
Um, also, just the fact that these flowers might smell different than our native plants might cause it to um, be less attractive to pollinators. Um, so that's something to just consider when you're buying plants from the store and put them on your landscape that they might be pretty, but they're not going to help our pollinators, which are in decline very much because they have been bred specifically for certain traits and not on the landscape. Um, and this just kind of goes into a little bit more about that, how our insects have um, specifically evolved with our native plants. And those native plants have also evolved on this landscape to be maybe more drought resistant once a native plant restoration is installed, we usually recommend people plant, I mean, water it for a few weeks, but at, especially after um, the harshest summer months are over, they really don't really need to water it after that first growing season um, versus a turf grass lawn where you have to water quite frequently. Um, these are also perennials, so they're able to um, withstand our harsh winters, which is really nice. Um, you don't have to go out and buy pansies every year. Uh, not that those aren't pretty, but um, these are on your landscape and they'll come back after every harsh winter. Um, they're also resistant to a lot of pests and diseases. Uh, one big one is the Asian beetle, where we see those a lot on um, ornamental plants from Asia, but when we go to our native plant restorations, there might be a few Asian beetles on the native plants. They're not actively eating the native plants, except for maybe um, some wild grape, but it's, it's just nice that um, our plants, our native plants can be a little bit more resistant to pests, especially if they aren't something that um, the invasive pests are looking for because they didn't uh, evolve with that native plant. Uh, diseases aren't really a huge issue for our native plants too. We don't really have to spray fungicides or um, a lot of repellents onto our native plants. The only thing that we really run into issue with are deer and rabbits that eat our plants. But a lot of times if we put a fence up, then um, that kind of deters those. And even when a plant is defoliated from a rabbit, they're often able to um, regrow because their root systems are so uh, deep and there's a lot of nutrients stored in those root systems, so they, they survive. Um, and yeah, just that benefit to local wildlife. A lot of times these plants are the host plants for our native insects. Um, so having these on the landscape are super beneficial for them. Um, and also, I'll go into a little bit more about how it's benefit, beneficial to local wildlife right now. Um, I think we've covered quite a few of these. Uh, one really big benefit for native plants is carbon sequestration. There's a lot of estimates out there that prairie plants offer a lot of um, the same or comparable carbon sequestration to our native forests and trees as well. When people think about carbon sequestration, they think trees are a big um, like carbon sink, but in reality they are. But prairie plants also have that below ground root system that every year they bring more and more carbon from the atmosphere and store it in their root system. So that's super beneficial. And here is a diagram of that, kind of going into um, how deep some of these roots can get. These are in feet. So the, the um, longest root systems can be up to 15 feet long. Um, and then in this corner here, this is turf grass. So this is just a couple inches of turf grass roots versus a lot of these 
oops, native plants um, that just offer a lot more. Um, the root systems really just, they, they're able to get down to those, those water tables and uh, stay alive. Uh, going over a little bit of the differences between native plants on your landscape, you might have a lot of different conditions depending on where you live. And when we make a native planting, we usually try to have a lot of different diversity in that plant list. And where you put those plants depends on a lot of different conditions, including soil, um, but also exposure, if the area is sunny or shady, um, if the soil is wet or dry, um, clay or loamy, things like that. And this picture kind of shows those different environments. We start up in the upland area where we have a lot of our prairie plants. And then the transition zone is a place where these plants might be able to handle um, a little bit of inundation. Um, these are plants found a lot on the shoreline where that water might uh, go up and down. These are plants that you might put in a rain garden because they can handle a little bit of that, um, that those differences. Um, and then the emergent plants here are, are plants where their root systems are actively growing in the, the, um, the soil, but a lot of their parts are coming out of the water. So these are, these are plants that like it in the water, but their plant parts their flowers, their leaves kind of emerge outside the water. And then the aquatic plants are those that just stay underwater completely. Here's a few examples of some of our, our upland plants. Um, and to kind of think about your specific situation and how you could bring plants closer to your home, um, some people have large multi-acre areas where they could put a giant prairie and some people might have small lots where they just want to kind of take out a little bit of, of land, maybe a part of their lot that's hard to mow um, to put in native plants and other people might just live in an apartment and want to have a couple planters, um, or you know, have a little thing of native plants on their their boulevard. So keep that in mind when we're going through some of these these native plants. I would say echinacea, purple coneflower. This one grows pretty readily in most upland conditions. Um, it likes full sun, but it, it can handle some partial shade too. If you're someone who needs a plant that's super dependable. Echinacea is one of those. Um, also, Black-Eyed Susan. This colonizes an area that's been disturbed very quickly. We, when we do a restoration that might need a seeding, um, I, we often put Rutabecchia herda in our seed mix because it's what we call a pioneer species, something that will jump up really quickly, germinate. It flowers its first year. It's very hardy. It might fizzle out after a couple years um, and let other plants kind of take its place. But it's definitely one that um, does well in a lot of conditions. Bergamot up here, this is often called bee balm that people know it by. Uh, it's attractive to many, many different species of bees, um, moths, butterflies. And that's another good one to have on a landscape, um, even if it's a large prairie or maybe you just have a small area that you want to um, plant. Going over here to um, this butterfly weed, that's another popular one where it's a little bit more sensitive in its growing conditions, but um, people really love the orange color and it stays shorter if you have a um, an area where you don't want things to get super tall, but you want to add some benefit to 
pollinators, that's another one that stays shorter and is a very good option. Um, here's some shady plants that are often found in woodland areas, but if you have a shady section of your property that you want to add native plants, these are all really great options. Um, a lot of these you might see blooming right now, actually. Jacob's Ladder is blooming, Jack in the Pulpit, Columbine, a uh, wild geranium should be starting here pretty soon. Um, Canada anemone up here. This is a, a, a shady plant that likes it a little bit more wet. Um, but really, these are all great options for a shady place. Columbine is very popular and is one that will grow in a lot of different soil conditions. Um, so I highly recommend that one. Zigzag goldenrod is one that blooms in the fall, and that's a really um, important thing to remember too. You want something that will bloom in the spring for the early emerging pollinators, but also something that will bloom in the summer and then something that blooms in the fall, just so there's um, a food source for our pollinators throughout the growing season. Here are some shoreline plants. A lot of these kind of get a little bit taller because their feet are their feet are in the uh, they're wet they're in wet saturated soils so um, they they have access to that water and can grow a little bit taller if you would like shorter plants I recommend uh, marsh marigold that's actually blooming right now that stays shorter blue flag iris is one we use in all of our restorations right on the shoreline where it's uh, the water um, needs to shoreline. That is really great at stabilizing the shoreline. Uh, swamp milkweed is another uh, milkweed. It's in the Asclepius family. These are all host plants for uh, the monarch butterfly. So having several different Asclepius species in your restoration is a good idea if you want to help out the monarch butterfly. And something that's a little bit interesting about the milkweed species, their flowers are actually kind of designed to trap the feet of insects that are visiting it for pollen and nectar. Um, and when the foot gets trapped in there, it just causes the insect to thrash around and get more pollen on it. So it's kind of a, uh, I mean, people theorize that this was evolved to um, specifically trap pollinators to get more pollen on it. Um, I really like it because that means that the pollinator can't go anywhere and I can take a picture of it um, because most bees just fly away before I can take a picture. So, I mean, the bee can escape, it just escapes with more pollen. And that's something that I find really interesting that the shape of these flowers have been um, designed to, to um, maximize the amount of pollen that is given to a, a bee or, um, I've seen a lot of hornets and wasps on those too. And here is cardinal flower. A lot of people love cardinal flower because it's, it's one of the only, red native plants we have. It's very striking and it's also visited a lot by hummingbirds. So that's another um, thing to consider if you'd like to attract more birds, be it hummingbirds that are there for the nectar or maybe birds that come and visit during the migration period for seeds. That's something to consider when you're putting your plant uh, list together. Here's some common emergent plants. These are plants that, like I said, their root systems are in the soil of the stream or lake or pond, but their plant parts are, are coming out of the water. So um, my favorite here is the arrowhead. There's a couple of different species of arrowhead that we have in Minnesota, um, but I think that's one that a lot of people can recognize because it's in the name arrowhead, it, uh, the shape is the arrow. Um, a lot of these we put in our restorations because 
They're great at breaking up the wave action that comes on a lake. Uh, a lot of people who use boats or jet skis or even if there's a storm and that those waves get going along a, a shoreline that can cause erosion. But um, if there's a large stand of say stops and bulrush before that wave can hit the shoreline, then that slows that water down and prevents erosion. Um, a lot of these plants too offer seeds that are eaten by ducks. Um, Burreed is a good example of that. Hard stem bulrush, soft stem bulrush, they're all eaten by ducks. Um, there's also uh, benefits to, I want to say muskrat. They're kind of an issue for us. They burrow into our shorelines, but they're also a native species and they will also eat these plants. Um, here we go into a few ground covers. If that's something you're interested in, taking out lawn to, um, but you still need something to cover the area with that. And um, maybe you want your plant list to be a little bit shorter. Wild ginger is a great cover that spreads out. Um, and here we have sprinkle sedge that is really good at colonizing a hillside that's shady. Um, that can be an issue, finding plants to grow on a shady hillside. And in that case, we use a lot of sprinkle sedge. A lot of large leaf aster um, is shady, so that spreads out. Um, yeah, these are really great options if you want um, to, to have an air, maybe it, the turf grass isn't growing very well, then to put these ground covers in, they, they really spread out and monopolize an area. Hey, Tracy, quick question on that topic. Sure. sure. Uh, we got one about uh, canary, reed canary grass. Are those yeah. ground covers able to compete? Um, I would say the, the one that would probably be the best for a reed canary grass situation is this Canada, Canada anemone um, because reed canary grass likes it wet and so does Canada anemone and Canada, Canada anemone can survive inundation of water if, if an area floods. These other native plants I would say you would want to do a lot of site prep first to get as much reed canary grass out before you plant um, and then after that, I think some of these could do a pretty pretty good job after a few years. Um, but I would say the, the canon enemy is probably your best bet for that. Okay. And then definitely remember your trees and shrubs when you're doing a native planting. They're really important in a lot of shoreline restorations to stabilize the shoreline. Over here is some dogwood, some red twig dogwood. Um, some people call it red osier dogwood. That grows really well by the shoreline and their root systems are really important for holding that soil together. A lot of these shrubs and trees offer um, berries that are migrating birds really need in the, um, in the fall. And also just for kind of aesthetic purposes and to have something a little different texture wise and um, you know just to offer a little bit more of diversity. There's a lot of native um, butterflies that use trees as their host plants. Um, a lot of willows and maples, things like that. So definitely don't forget trees and shrubs. There's a lot of different heights to some of these shrubs as well. This is a native honeysuckle that will stay a few feet tall. Um, and this is the high bush cranberry, American cranberry, that can get a little bit taller, um, but still stay pretty reasonable as far as height, not really like a tree. And just um, aesthetically, these are pleasing when uh, a lot of these change color in the fall and are really pretty. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, we're 
these are just more pictures of wildlife that benefit from pollen or uh, our native species. Like I said before, um, make sure you're you have something that's blooming throughout the season. Also, diversity is a big, big thing that I can't stress enough. Just keep adding different plants to increase that diversity. Um, you'll keep seeing more and more different species of insects if you keep adding plants. Um, here we have a honeybee on uh, some butterfly weed. I think someone asked about um, different plants you could plant for your honeybee hive and really all the plants that I've mentioned that are flowering will definitely attract those honeybees. So um, for bird species, echinacea is really great for, um, here's a, a finch that is on a, a echinacea, a coneflower species. They, we see them move through, um, and go after all those different uh, seeds on this echinacea. There's also um, Cytoats grama. You can't really see it behind here. I should mention grasses are really important for these native plant restorations as well because they offer structure for the um, the flowering plants. A lot of times come August, all the tall flowering plants will kind of fall over and if you have some grasses in there, they just kind of keep everything up standing um, and offer that structure. And a lot of native butterflies will nest in the grasses as well. This is a skipper butterfly right here, and that is something that uses um, native grasses to nest in. Um, here we have an ambush bug, and this is a predatory bug, it's a native bug that will lie in wait on some of our native plants. And it uses these almost mantis looking um, arms to impale its, um, its prey, which we have seen a lot of being these, these pex skippers. So I just wanna emphasize that there's these interactions between wildlife that if you have these native plants on your land, Actually, here's the ambush bug here waiting for this pet skipper. So um, just remember that if, if you have these native plants on your landscape, you're front row and center to a lot of this dramatic um, predator-prey interactions. And as someone who really likes, you know, observing all these different species and how they interact in the wild, it's really nice to, to see that. Here's a sweat bee. Um, there's a wide range of different native pollinators and um, some of them are really brilliantly colored. A lot of people, when they think about bees, they think about the honey bee, which is, um, you know, just your regular yellow bee, but they actually come in a very wide range of colors and sizes. A lot of them have different length of tongues, which allow them to visit different plants. Some can only visit these open faced flowers like aster because their tongues are so short, but other ones have really long tongues um, and they can get into those more tubular flowers, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, some flowers are specially evolved to only allow certain pollinators to um, visit them and pollinate them. This is actually a rusty patch bumblebee, which is an endangered species. This is one we found last year in Stillwater. Um, and bumblebees have a certain way of pollinating plants called buzz pollination, where they grab onto the plant with their, their arms and they buzz at this frequency that allow the pollen to fall out of the flower. And actually tomatoes and uh, blueberries are pollinated by buzz pollination. So if we didn't have bumblebees, we wouldn't have tomatoes or blueberries, which is good to know. Um, and there's a lot of attention around this bumblebee here. The Lawns to Legumes program is actually pretty um, focused on uh, 
creating habitat for the rusty patch. It's Minnesota state flower, I mean, sorry, state bee, which is really, really interesting. Um, and it's, it's something that we just really should all uh, focus on. It used to be a very common bee that you would find all the time. It had a wide range and now today it's very uncommon to see these. We only saw two of them last year. Um, so it's, it's kind of important that a lot of these government organizations are coming together to provide funding um, to plant these native species to benefit this endangered species. Um, here's some more native bees and butterflies. Um, this one here is called a red spotted purple and it's actually on a wild onion that we have in our greenhouse. A lot of times these pollinators will come into our greenhouse to visit these plants. Uh, they can't even wait for it to be put in the ground. They have to come in and, and pollinate our plants uh, right there. Um, also, we get a lot of monarch caterpillars in our greenhouse and they can completely defoliate a plant, but that plant will still grow. And um, it's really fun to see these native plants at work even before they've left the greenhouse. Um, here's a couple pictures of different bird nests we found. Here's a ground nesting bird. I'm not sure what exactly it is, but um, this is a nest that's directly on the ground, not in a tree, not in a bush. Um, and we have to be really careful when we're walking through our restorations because a lot, a lot of ground nesting birds use them to build their nests. Um, this nest was a, I believe it was a um, red-winged blackbird, and a lot of people advocate for not taking out cattail because they think that's the only thing a red-winged blackbird will nest in, but this is one that was placed on a ironweed plant. Um, so without the cattail, these red-winged blackbirds will still um, create uh, their nest in habitat um, in, on our native plants in those wetland situations. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of ducks and geese also have their nests in our restorations, which are pretty fun to find. Um, here's a few other examples of wildlife we find on a daily basis. A lot of frogs, um, a lot of turtles, various different insects, arachnids. Um, the, uh, I haven't made a list of all the different species we've seen in our restorations, but it would be very long. Um, just want to, again, touch on how these restorations can look um, when you add a lot of diversity. It, it's not just for the bees and the butterflies. Aesthetically, this can be just as pleasing as, if not more than a rose garden or having some hostas in your backyard. It, there's so many different colors. There's so many different shapes that you can add to your landscape, uh, depending on the flowers that you add to your list. So, um, that just aesthetically can really add a lot to a property. Um, and we'll talk a little bit now about how to get started. A few things you should ask yourself are if there's any natives already present on your landscape, or maybe there's a remnant area, a park somewhere nearby that you can kind of go and take a look at and see if there's any um, plants already available. Sometimes there's herbology records at the libraries you can look at to see what was their pre-development. Um, you want to get a good idea of some of the invasive species you might be battling. Um, more common weeds we'll get into in a second, but kind of take note on what you need to, to fight in order to get the native species there. Um, sometimes if you already have natives there, you can just do kind of an interplanting adding more diversity to your current native planting, or you might need to do a complete overhaul, taking out those invasive species and adding native plants. Um, and yeah, just look for clues to add um, some idea for what you want to add to your plant list. 
make sure you know how much sun this area will get, how wet this area gets on a, on a regular basis, and that will provide you um, with some good ideas for your plant list. Um, another thing you should consider, we really only seed, get seeds or plants from, a, you know, they should be regional, they should be found in your area within 150 miles, that's kind of um, the go-to for finding native plants. If it's something even um, that's found here in the Twin Cities that might not necessarily be found in the more boreal area of northern Minnesota. So keep that in mind. Sometimes what works here doesn't always work up at your cabin. You definitely want to avoid greenhouses that use pesticides, specifically uh, systematic neonicotinoids. These are pesticides that are added to plants to, um, to keep them from getting eaten by bugs but these can stay in the system of the plant and harm bugs that are beneficial after that plant leaves the greenhouse. So um, ask, ask the place where you get your plants if they've used neonicotinoids on them or not. Um, you might also want to consider the size of the plant that you're installing. If you want to plant a lot of little two inch plants or if you want to go bigger, um, the bigger plants are more established. They have um, the root systems that will grow faster um, and maybe will bloom that year if that's something that's important to you or these two inch plants like maybe you want to buy more of those in order to add more diversity but then you're going to have to wait a little bit longer for that plant to to flower. Um, I mentioned mus uh, muskrats before. Here's some muskrats that have been burrowing into our, our shoreline so we're putting a fence up that might be a good idea until the plant's established to put that fencing up for geese even. Um, they'll come and they'll pull the plants right out of the ground. So if you have a fence there until at least the plants establish a little bit, um, usually we take the fence out within two growing seasons, if not earlier. So the plants will establish fairly quickly. It just gives the plants a little bit of time to grow their root systems without having muskrat or geese eating at them. Mulch is also something we use in a lot of our restorations to hold in moisture and to prevent weed growth until those plants can establish and start spreading out. And those, once they spread out, um, they'll shade out a lot of weeds as well. But until that happens, it's kind of nice to have at least three inches of shredded hardwood mulch. Some people use cypress mulch or pine needles for their mulch, but we have found that those kind of float away, especially if it's by a, a shoreline. So keep that in mind too when you're picking your mulch. Um, there's a lot of things you want to consider when you're doing an installation, including the site preparation. Um, if you need to add any erosion control materials, if you want to seed a project versus adding those plugs um, and maybe sometimes you might need to amend the soil as well so when you're installing your project kind of keep those those um, factors in mind the biggest thing I think people need to um, remember is site preparation if you don't do any site preparation before your installation it might be pretty weedy um, after you've installed your plant. So it's better to do a little bit more work on the front end before you put your plants in, remove those invasive species, um, and then you'll have a little bit easier time to have the, your native plants grow. Um, here's a couple different ways to do a site prep. Uh, there's herbicide to just go in and spray a site, kill anything that's there, kind of make it a blank slate. Um, you could also use solarization or black plastic. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. And definitely afterwards, try not to leave a lot of bare soil. I talked about mulch, but if you're doing a seeding, a lot of times we use this straw blanket. 
and it just prevents a lot of this open bare dirt where number one um, weed seeds can take root in very easily and colonize that soil or it's also at risk for erosion if it rains that water will hit that bare soil and run off fairly easily so you you might want to cover it um, with some sort of erosion control material. A lot of people also just manually remove their sod with a sod um, shovel, manual, you know, hard, hard work. Um, but you can also rent uh, machines that will take that out for you. And that's a pretty, pretty great way to remove sod without using chemicals or black plastic. Herbicide has its benefits. Um, it, it creates a pretty clean slate, but some people don't like using herbicide. There's definitely conditions where you don't want to use it if it's too close to uh, you know, a water supply or a sensitive area, um, or you just don't want to buy it yourself and have it lying around. Um, we use it for a lot of our site preps, but not for all of them. It's just a, a tool that you can definitely have in your toolbox, but there are other options available as well. Um, here's an example of us interceding a low mow area. It's pretty easy to do. It, it might be because you have a lower budget too that you just want to start off with interceding with the low mow and then kind of have that eventually take over your turf grass and shade out some of your Kentucky bluegrass. You don't need chemicals. Um, it's a little bit slower, so you definitely need to have more patience where in these areas, um, some of this turf grass will kind of outcompete that fescue. You have to keep on uh, raking some of that that stuff out and adding seed and adding um, your, your, you know, sometimes you can even add prairie seed into a turf grass lawn like this and get some plants to come up, but just know it's going to be a pretty slow multi-year project. Um, a lot of people are using black plastic to kill off their turf grass. This is a picture of an area before we added black plastic, and then um, this is what it looks like with that black plastic on it. Uh, some people like it because they think that you're not using any chemicals, but you should keep in mind the chemicals that go into this plastic, and now that you have this plastic, when it's, when it's done doing its job, do you just throw it away? Do you reuse it? Like, there's still, it's not a zero um, waste process for for creating a, a site prepped area. If you still have this giant sheet of black plastic and in an age where we're trying to use less plastic, this is definitely not always the way you wanna go uh, unless you can reuse it over and over again. Um, it also bakes the soil so it, increases the temperature of the, the soil and fries those um, non-native plants, but it also fries the beneficial mycorrhizae, the little bacteria in the soil and fungus in the soil that really benefits a lot of native plants. So you might be killing the turf grass, but you're also killing those beneficial um, bacteria as well. And that later on can cause some issues with uh, establishing native plants. Um, it also makes it kind of a slow process. You have to wait for the turf grass to get hot enough. Last year we had a lot of rainy days and there, there wasn't a lot of um, really warm 80 degree sunny days for this to work. Just a little bit slower and then afterwards once you take the plastic off you have to wait for that soil to kind of regain its its health. Um, definitely when you're doing restorations, use signs. Um, sometimes your neighbors don't appreciate you taking out all your turf grass, and, but if you explain what's going on, if you have signs that these are native plants, that these are intentional, 
sometimes people might think that uh, these areas are weedy, but if you have kind of signs that say, no, these are plants, that like this is a work in process, then um, that really kind of goes, um, it, it kind of sends the message that this is an intentional area and you're not just letting your lawn go. Um, here's a sign at Sucker Lake that I think is really awesome because it has not just information about the native plant restoration, but different fish and animals, insects, all that stuff at that site. So that one's a, a pretty awesome sign, you guys. <laughs> um, we'll go into a little, a few project examples now. Here's some bee lawns we'll talk about. Um, and a lot of people m talk about embracing some non-native species when you're talking about bee lawns. And this is kind of a controversial subject um, where there's purists where they really don't want any non-native species to be in a, a bee lawn. Um, I'm coming around to the idea of some of these being in a bee lawn just because you could spend all your time pulling out Creeping Charlie and your neighbor has it in their lawn and it's, it's always going to start coming in um, unless you use some really harsh chemicals. This one down here is Siberian squill and I always thought that it was a plant that was kind of a spring ephemeral. It bloomed, it was really pretty um, and then it went away and it didn't really um, impact any native species. Now I'm hearing more and more that it creates a lot of um, really dense, um, really dense, like uh, really dense areas where it's not just in a lawn where I didn't really care. I, I'm seeing it more and more in the woodlands where it will push out a lot of ephemeral native species. So keep that in mind when you're making your bee lawns that some of these species might be okay, but just keep an eye on it, monitor it make sure that they're not going into the, the nearby native uh, woodlands. Um, we talked a little bit about fescues. Those are super important for bee lawns um, because they have very deep roots, but they also aesthetically kind of look like your normal turf grass lawns, just a little bit longer. They have a really nice way of getting tall, but then kind of laying over. Um, and they also require less watering. They're a really good, um, really good option for people that have really steep slopes on their property, like uh, hillsides that you don't want to mow. So fescues are definitely the way to go in that regard. I would recommend using signage for your bee lawns and your low mow lawns as well, and checking local weed ordinances, making sure. Um, that there's, there's no laws against uh, having longer lawns. Um, and that information is pretty accessible on most city websites. And um, it's really just helpful to check those first. Here's a short prairie grass um, area. This is an area where it's, I, um, I think this is one of your guys' sites where the turf grass just wasn't growing very well here, and they put in some, some. It looks like blue grama. Um, it looks really nice, and and it's just these areas where you can still use it for recreational purposes because it's it's shorter grasses and um, it's not the front yard, it's not the backyard. It's kind of these side lawn areas that just aren't worth bringing out a mower to mow. So it's a very aesthetically nice bee lawn. Here's a few flowers that we often recommend for our bee lawns. Um, these can attract your, your pollinators. Um, they stay shorter and they also kind of stay, um, they're, they're very hardy as far as sometimes with salt too, that's an issue with boulevard plantings where a lot of salt comes from the streets 
in the winter and our snow plows blow a lot of salt into the front yard. So keep in mind that um, some of these native plants are pretty salt tolerant as well, um, like this purple prairie clover. They need less water and they stay shorter, which is a big consideration with bee lawns. You don't want something that's three or four foot feet tall in a bee lawn. Um, these are more shady plants. Uh, the Virginia bluebells are blooming right now. This is Jacob's ladder that's blooming right now. Dutchman's breeches. These are all plants that are sh are short, shady, and can grow in one of those those bee lawns. I'll talk a little bit about shorelines. Um, here's just a couple examples. Two of Imagine this being that hillside with turf grass, and now you've put a lot of different flowering plants on it to not only slow down the water that's running down the hill, but also adding habitat. And you don't have to water this, you don't have to mow it. Um, we're seeing here, there's, oops. Um, this is by a, a stormwater retention pond, and this is a pond that can fluctuate quite a bit depending on how much precipitation we have in a year and these plants are just loving it, doing great, and also kind of improving some of this water quality here. Um, here's a, an example of a shoreline where maybe they didn't want their whole hill to be a restoration, but they're putting a little buffer strip between their lawn and the, the lake, and that's really helping to keep a lot of, you know, maybe um, those pollutants running down the hill from entering the lake. It's pretty. Here's Birch Lake. Uh, we do the maintenance on Birch Lake. We did the, a little installation here. Here's a before and after picture. It's a great place to walk on a sunny day. Um, every time we go, we see a ton of birds, butterflies, bees in, in this area. Um, there's also a lot of fish that kind of come up. Sometimes there's snakes that fall into a lake and it's better to kind of keep those there for fish habitats. It's just um, definitely a really great area for the lake. There's this busy road right here and this buffer is helping to prevent a lot of those heavy metals, a lot of the sediment from the road from entering Birch Lake. A few more pictures of Birch Lake. A lot of pretty flowers. Um, I believe this is part of your cost share program as well, where they installed a, a restoration. And yeah, it's really great that um, these organizations exist to give out a lot of that cost share money where um, I'm pretty sure most of our homeowners, our residential sites, have implemented those cost share funds. So definitely check with your little local watershed district, your local um, city organization, uh, so in water conservation district, they, they all have really great benefits for helping to add some of this to their landscape. They, it really helps them too with um, helping to improve water quality, so. Uh, here's Sucker, Sucker Channel. I had lunch there the other day. It's just looking really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, just a ton of flowers, a ton of diversity. Um, it's a channel that leads into these lakes. So it's something that is a great area to put a native restoration to help um, the pollutants from entering the lake. There's all the turf grass beforehand, and now there's just a, a buffer kind of protecting that shoreline. Here's a private pond in a dyno. We have a lot of stormwater ponds where we do our shorelines. Um, here's us planting the restoration. These stormwater ponds fluctuate quite a bit. They gather stormwater from a lot of area, and they're used to 
um, kind of hold sediment before and to filter pollutants before um, the water goes on and maybe it, these ponds are connected to your local lake, your local river. So they're really important to help filter those pollutants before they enter your lake. But having a restoration around these ponds really helps too to um, kind of slow down that water before it even enters. Um, here's another pond shrimp line that you guys helped install. Looks really great. Lots of flowers blooming. Um, yeah. I really like when uh, these restorations have these borders like this. You can make everything look super intentional. You can, um, it doesn't have to always look like a random place where someone just stopped mowing. Definitely add, you know, still landscaping, um, things like this, borders. Some people put larger, big boulders in them to add some aesthetics. It, it can be um, whatever you want to do to, to make it yours, to make sure that you're bringing native plants close to your house and getting the benefits of those. Oops, it's the same pond. Here's another residential shoreline. Um, and you can see that cardinal flower blooming, all this red. Things are at different heights, which is really important um, just for aesthetics, but also uh, for the plants. There's some sedges in here, some iris. It's just something more to look at than just your regular turf grass lawn. Prairies. Um, this was an area in Bloomington where they just really did not want to mow it anymore, but also this leads directly into a, a local waterway and water from all these houses were getting directed into the swale and rushing down. They were doing um, testing of the nearby creek and it was super overloaded with um, phosphorus, nitrogen, so they needed a way to stop those um, nutrients from entering that local stream. There's a lot of local streams that may be historically could have been good trout streams, um, but now they're just kind of overloaded with different nutrients. And some of these prairies really help slow that water down, keep it from entering those local streams without all those nutrients. So here's a, an after picture. They don't have to mow that anymore. Tons of bees and butterflies, looks great. A backyard prairie. Um, some people don't like having native plants in their front yard, so they have a ton of them in their backyard. And this is just another way of bringing native plants to your property and um, things look, look really great. Uh, rain gardens. Before, pretty boring turf grass area and then after um, here's the picture of a couple years of it established. Um, some people use shrubs and native plants to hide these electrical boxes that are kind of ugly to look at. Um, maybe your air conditioner, like there's just a lot of different things that you can use to hide stuff and to um, make your, your property look a little bit more appealing. There's another swale in Blamo. Um, and yeah, a lot of different diversity. Uh, here's some some Joe pieweed. I always see a ton of bees and butterflies all over Joe pieweed. That's a pretty popular one. It also um, can handle those wetter areas. Sometimes Joe pieweed can get a little bit tall um, for certain areas. So sometimes we cut it down in June, July, and it'll still bloom just a little bit shorter. So just know there's those management strategies as well to kind of keep things um, in line and, and manage them to be a little bit more landscaped. Just, and the plants can take it, they, they'll still bloom, they'll just bloom a little bit shorter. It's another rain garden, That's, this is Rattlesnake Master. It's a very unique um, looking native plant. Here's another great example of people using 
landscaping rock. Um, a lot of times we use borders like this uh, with native plants or native grasses or sedges. You can definitely, there's a ton of designs out there, planting designs that you can follow to make sure things look a little bit more intentional um, and then your neighbors won't get mad at you. Here's some tamarack trees that they've added in there to um, just add a, a little bit more diversity. Another look, tamarack are, are really great for those floodwater plants, um, can handle that inundation of water. Sometimes uh, you might just have a small area that you want to to add some native plants to. Um, and we, we call those just like butterfly gardens, small native plantings. Here's a few examples. Here's an example near Weaver Lake where someone just wanted to do a little thing around their mailbox. And it's really pretty. Um, this is an area where it, a lot of snow gets pushed into it, a lot of salt um, from the roads gets washed into it, and these plants are still doing great. Real quick, Tracy, we're at the five minute mark. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go through a couple of these pretty fast. Just um, gather, again, there might be areas that you want to just take out piece by piece. Here's an, another example in um, uh, your guys' neck of the woods where it looks like they just, they went over time and probably um, applied for some of that cost share money every once in a while and just took it piece by piece. More areas where things were too, too shady for turf grass, they didn't want to mow them. There's, there's never an area that's too shady for us native plants or too sunny. There's always going to be a native plant that fits your needs. Here's um, some native plants at my grandparents' house that we put in and those are doing great. Some areas that are too wet, there's always going to be a native plant that you can find to put in that area. Um, and, you know, there's we see a lot of times where people have turf grass and their motors are getting stuck there's going to be a plant out there that's native that will fit that area. You don't have to mow anymore. Sometimes when you stop mowing, these are some of the native plants that just come up on their own. This is at my grandparents' cabin. Um, there's some harebells that came up and now my family knows not to mow that area because I'll be sad. And uh, yeah, you, if you stop mowing, a lot of times you'll find violets. Uh, a lot, this is, um, Blue vervain comes up in a lot of wetland areas if you stop mowing close to your 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 shoreline. So just keep that in mind. There's there's natives out there with a seed bank that they'll they'll come up. Talking real quick about maintenance, um, a key to that is just identifying the weeds versus the native plants. And a lot of times guidebooks really help with that. You want to prioritize your timing to take out plants before they go to seed like this thistle. Um, if something's flowering, definitely spend your time taking that out before it goes to seed because your problems are just going to be exacerbated by that. Um, there's different techniques. We use a lot of hand pulling, weed whipping, herbicide. We um, might burn in the spring if it's a prairie and it needs to be burned. You might replant an area if you thought a plant would do well in that area and it didn't, we'll try something different. Weed whipping is really helpful to cut those seed heads off or those flowers off before the seeds mature. So definitely um, keep a lot of different techniques in your maintenance toolbox for various different um, situations that might come up. A lot of people ask us about spring cleanups and if we need to or fall cleanups if they need to take out that material. Um, and we try to say if you want to take it out, then leave stems like this about six to 12 inches in height. So um, native bees or other insects that nest in those pithy stems can still use those. But a lot of times if you just want to leave that vegetation from last year up, 
then um, you really don't need to take out too much. Sometimes we'll weed whip it down and mulch it up so it acts as a weed suppression. And yeah, like I said, prioritize your your weeds before they go to seed. Um, we also advocate when we're talking about plants close to home to keep a journal. Phenology is kind of the, the study of um, looking at these native plants and how they differ from year to year. So oftentimes we'll record when something starts blooming, when it ends, and then look at that from year to year. A lot of our clients like to keep track of these things and then, um, you know, look at it over time and maybe ice out is different every year. Maybe things bloom at a different time. It's just a really nice way to kind of make this a hobby. You can record your observations when you saw your first hummingbird of the year, how many, um, like, duck uh, babies you saw on your lake, things like that. Just kind of keeping um, nature in mind at all times and, and recording your observations really kind of is a, is a fun thing to do when you have this on your property and you see these, these things every day. So that's just something we like to, to advocate to our clients. Um, and then around Vlamo, you guys have a lot of these picture posts, which is great for phenology. Um, you can snap a picture and then if everyone, maybe Nick, you want to talk about it a little bit more, but um, it's a great way to study phenology in a lot of these places as well. Um, yeah, I won't say anything. Uh, if okay. people have questions, they're free to follow up and, uh, okay. and go that way. Okay. Um, here's a few additional resources. iNaturalist is an app that helps you identify uh, pretty much anything be it native plants, bees, birds, fungi. Um, that's something nice to have handy. Arrest the Pest is another app where you can report sightings of invasive species. Um, and then if you want to learn more about Minnesota wildflowers specifically, this is a great website, Minnesota wildflowers, that um, talk both about native plants and invasive species. For those of you in Wisconsin, um, this also has a lot of great information. A lot of those plants are found in Wisconsin as well. Here's some of my favorite guidebooks. Um, a lot of people need that install these native plants and these restorations have trouble um, identifying what's a weed and what's a native plant. And just whatever book you get, find one that you like, um, have it on hand. They're very, very helpful. Um, to help identify native versus invasive plants. It really helps weeding. And um, this one here by Heather Holm has both native plants, but then also common pollinators of your native plants. And that's, that's a good one to have both a guidebook for plants and pollinators. And sorry I rushed you that last part, but I think, I think that's all I had. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Any questions? Yeah. We'll take a few moments, few minutes for questions. 